The title of this video is the Unreal Ghostbusters lawsuit, and I mean unreal in the literal sense of that word, meaning not real or non-existent. I don't mean unreal as in this thing is so amazing, I can't believe it's actually real. Man, f*** the English language. The Mandela Effect is a phenomenon by which a significant number of people share a recollection of something that never actually happened. It received its name due to how, for some reason, many were convinced former South African President Nelson Mandela died in prison in the 1980s instead of what really happened, which was him dying in 2013. I mean, neither worked out for him in the end since he was dead in both scenarios, but at least in real life he got an extra 30 years. Other popular examples of the Mandela Effect include thinking Darth Vader said, Luke, I am your father, when he actually said, no, I am your father, or how Sinbad once starred as a genie in a film that never existed. For some time now, I've wondered if I've been living my own personal Mandela Effect regarding a lawsuit, or the threat of one, involving Ghostbusters that no one else remembers. I'm not talking about the Huey Lewis lawsuit over Ray Parker Jr. stealing I Want a New Drug for the Ghostbusters theme, or how at the last minute Columbia Pictures had to pony up a wad of cash to secure the rights to the name of Ghostbusters from the animation studio Filmation. The lawsuit I'm referring to is from the late 1980s when Ernie Hudson filed, or threatened, action against the studio for cutting him out of the original home VHS release of the first Ghostbusters film. The thing is, there seems to be absolutely no evidence of this anywhere except in my own memory. And when you get to be this age, your memory can be as dependable as a dry fart on all-you-can-eat fajita night at Chili's. Why do I think this lawsuit existed when there is nothing anywhere online that even hints at it? In the early 1990s, a friend of mine's family owned a video and satellite TV store. I would occasionally hang out in their shop and had access to a lot of industry trade magazines scattered around the back office. According to one article I swear I read at the time, Ernie Hudson sued those responsible for the pan and scan of the original Ghostbusters home release because their version cut his character Winston out of the film by a significant amount. For people below a certain age, the terms pan and scan and letterbox may need explaining. To avoid getting into a lot of technical jargon, we'll keep this extremely simple. Back when televisions were mostly square, in order to squeeze a rectangular film into that shape, during the transfer to video, technicians would point the lens at wherever the action was on the scene. If the action moved during the shot, they would also move the lens accordingly, panning it over the scan. The obvious problem here is that if the rectangle is wide enough, a lot of the original film gets cut. In a world of square televisions, the only other option was to shrink the rectangle so it would fit inside the square, creating black bars at the top and the bottom. This was referred to as letterbox. These days, with widescreen rectangular televisions being the norm, pan and scan is pretty much a dead technology, and most home video or streaming releases keep the rectangular shape of the film, or they squeeze it just enough to fit. We even see a hint of serendipity as older shows that were made for square televisions are made available on streaming services by either enlarging them to fit modern rectangular televisions, thus losing some of their picture, or they keep the same square shape by creating black bars on the left and the right. Those of us who grew up with pan and scan never really noticed it. I only first became aware of it in the late 1980s. At the time, however, I was very much against letterboxing the few times I ran across it, as those black bars at the top and the bottom were extremely distracting, and the footage on the screen was too small for most televisions at the time. Back then, a television was often considered large if it was 40 inches or bigger, whereas today, it's not uncommon to pick up a cheap 60-inch 4K model while getting groceries. 
I can, however, pinpoint the exact moment when I became a fan of Letterboxd. Again, in the early 1990s, another friend of mine very generously gave me his old Laserdisc player so I could watch the Beatles anthology that he also gave me. In addition, he let me borrow his extremely expensive Star Wars Deluxe Edition Laserdisc collection. Before DVD and Blu-ray, this was the absolute best version of the Star Wars trilogy available. In fact, it's still considered by many the best home video release of the trilogy because the original version included on the special edition DVD as a bonus feature was just a poor transfer of the Laserdisc version. These films were presented letterboxed or widescreen, and it was the first time I'd seen them like that since the theatrical releases over 10 years earlier. It was the following scene in The Empire Strikes Back that made me understand just what was sacrificed by pan and scan. First, here's the VHS version. Pay particular attention to the flickering at the left of the frame. Now the widescreen version. We're seeing the last moments of the ship's commander as his bridge is destroyed by an asteroid in the preceding shot. I never knew that existed until seeing the Laserdisc copy of the film. This blew my mind. And from that moment on, Pan and Scan was dead to me. You're dead to me, can opener! And I would only ever buy the letterbox version of any home video release. If you watch the widescreen copy of the first Ghostbusters, Ernie Hudson's character Winston is frequently on the far left or the far right of many scenes. If the shot is focused on Murray, Aykroyd, or Ramis, while Hudson is standing off to the side watching, this puts him just outside the square on which the pan and scan lens will be centered, almost guaranteeing he'll be cut out of the frame. It at least sounds credible that Hudson might have had enough of his screen time cut to be upset enough to sue. I decided to see for myself just how much of Ernie Hudson's performance was lost in the VHS pan and scan version of Ghostbusters. First, I went through the Blu-ray and isolated every scene that featured the character of Winston. This was tricky because even in the widescreen version, sometimes only his arm or his torso was in the shot. I decided to treat this like a lawyer working for Hudson's theoretical lawsuit and included those scenes in my tally, thus coming up with what I feel is the most liberal interpretation of his total screen time. I also included scenes that featured the character of Winston, despite it probably being a stunt double and not Hudson himself, because there would be no end of speculation as to whether or not the actor was actually on screen or if it was just a stand-in. I did not include footage of Winston talking off camera because the point of this project was to determine how much visual screen time the character lost, not audio. Next, I scanned my original copy of the Ghostbusters VHS into my computer. Incidentally, this also happens to be the very first videotape I ever bought. This was at a time when VHS tapes weren't priced for consumers and only rental stores had copies. Desperate to own it, I paid the one video store in my town at the time $90 for a used copy. When adjusted for inflation, that's about $230. Fifteen-year-old me was a f***ing idiot. I then went through and overlaid every scene with Winston from the VHS version on top of the Blu-ray copy to see where he was cut. This is not the time to argue whether or not the character of Winston would be considered an actual Ghostbuster or just an employee, because even though that could possibly justify choosing to cut him more than the others, this project is strictly to determine how much screen time an actor lost. Incidentally, this whole thing was extremely time consuming and took many hours to finish because I couldn't get the track map to work properly, mainly because the size of the pan and scan frame didn't remain constant throughout the VHS and would occasionally require adjusting. There was also the difference in frame rates between VHS and Blu-ray, which meant dropped frames had to be manually fixed. 
The final numbers also had to be adjusted because frequently the character wasn't completely cut out of a scene. Therefore, I categorized how much of Winston was removed from a particular shot based on whether he was partially cut, half cut, mostly cut, or fully cut. These figures were then weighted in increments of 25%. So if, for example, a 20-second scene had Winston still mostly there, it would be counted as him having lost just 5 seconds of screen time. If those 20 seconds had him half there, it would be treated as 10 seconds lost. If just a small portion of him remained on screen, it would count as 15 seconds gone, and if he was fully cut, all 20 seconds would be considered removed. Admittedly, I am no mathematician, and people who analyze statistics for a living would probably see my method and go full event horizon to avoid seeing what I did. But this felt like the best way for a layman like me to interpret the data. Looking at the raw figures, out of a total runtime of 6,308 seconds, of which the character of Winston was only featured for 877 seconds, or just 13.9% of the film, he lost 305 seconds, or almost 35% of his screen time. When adjusted by weight, he lost 236 seconds, or roughly 27%. It's safe to say Winston lost anywhere from a fourth to well over a third of his screen time due to the pan and scan process. When your total time in a film was already small enough to begin with, having that time further reduced like that might put you in the mood for litigation. Now we get into what may be the only evidence, admittedly completely circumstantial, of the Ernie Hudson lawsuit. The original VHS copy of Ghostbusters 2. This version of the film was released in a quasi-letterboxed format, which I never forgot because I watched this before my Empire Strikes Back epiphany, and those black bars on the top and the bottom of the screen were extremely annoying. This version also seems to be causing some confusion online, where many claim seeing the letterboxed version of Ghostbusters 2 as kids, while others argue that there was never a widescreen release at the time. Technically, both sides are correct. The original VHS was letterboxed, meaning the film was reduced, creating black bars at the top and the bottom, but this was not an actual widescreen release. What happened was whoever did the transfer decided to convert the original 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio to a 1.66 to 1 ratio instead of the usual 1.33 to 1 ratio for most home video releases at the time. In simpler terms, instead of reducing Ghostbusters 2 to a square, they reduced it to a squarish rectangle. This seemingly odd decision remains a mystery for most, but when you consider what I'm leading up to, it may finally make some sense. By doing a pan and scan at the 1.66 to 1 ratio, more of the original footage will remain. In other words, the technicians doing the transfer may have been trying their hardest to get the best of both the widescreen and pan and scan processes. But why go through this effort in the first place when most other contemporary home video releases just went straight pan and scan and didn't include the black bars that would no doubt confuse and irritate some viewers? Repeating the same steps I took with the sequel film by overlaying the VHS version on top of the Blu-ray copy, I discovered the following. While Winston saw more actual screen time in Ghostbusters 2 than the first film, 18% compared to just 14%, the pan and scan process still reduced his raw screen time by close to one-third, almost the same result as in the first film. However, this time around, when looking at the adjusted figures by weight, a significant amount of his screen time was saved down from one-fourth lost in the first film to just one-fifth lost in the second. In addition, the types of cuts made to Winston vary by a great deal between the two films. For Ghostbusters, the pan and scan completely cut him out by almost 18%, whereas in the sequel, it was just 12%. Additionally, the difference between when he was mostly cut versus just partially changed considerably between the two films. When they felt the need to cut Winston out in the first film, he was mostly or completely cut out. In the second, they seemed to try to preserve his performance as much as possible. 
Using the 1.66 to 1 ratio for the pan and scan absolutely results in less of the original film being deleted than using the standard 1.33 to 1 ratio. To further illustrate this, here's the original uncut museum entrance scene in Ghostbusters 2. Right, suck in the guts, guys, with the Ghostbusters. Now the VHS version. Suck in the guts, guys, with the Ghostbusters. When using the original VHS pan and scan at the 1.66 to 1 ratio, you can see, though trimmed, all four Ghostbusters remain recognizable on screen. Now let's see a hypothetical pan and scan if the technicians had used the 1.33 to 1 ratio. Right, suck in the guts, guys, with the Ghostbusters. While Hudson is still recognizable, Ramus is completely cut out. This shot is awkward though, and it's likely the pan and scan technician at the time would have changed the position of the lens to focus on just Ramus, Murray, and Aykroyd as the suck in our guts joke centered on those three. Right, suck in the guts, guys, with the Ghostbusters. In this hypothetical example, Winston is once again completely removed from the scene. So, can it be concluded that using the 1.66 to 1 ratio for the pan and scan is the sole reason for Ernie Hudson to remain more in the film? Perhaps, but while scanning the Ghostbusters 2 footage, it became apparent that there may have been another possibility for the 1.66 to 1 ratio choice. Even more than the first film, Bill Murray seemed to be separated from the other Ghostbusters by a significant amount of the runtime leaving Aykroyd, Ramis, and Hudson the only three on the screen and thus easier to keep together during the pan and scan. Unlike the first film, though, whenever Hudson was on screen with the other Ghostbusters, instead of being on the far left or the far right, he was often in the middle, while Ramis spent much of his time on the outside. While laying the VHS version over the Blu-ray, I noticed that Ramis was frequently cut out like how Hudson had been in the first film. Indeed, in a commentary track he recorded for Ghostbusters, Ramis mentioned having his screen time cut by the pan and scan process. Could he have used his clout to have the pan and scan on the second film be adjusted to preserve more of his performance? When the technicians were preparing the pan and scan for Ghostbusters 2, were they told ahead of time to scan it using the odd 1.66 to 1 ratio just to keep Hudson in the film more, as possibly part of an out-of-court settlement, or were they in the middle of the process at the usual 1.33 to 1 ratio and realized that Ramus, one of the main stars of the film, was constantly getting cropped out because of how he had been placed in the shots? Was it only then that they decided, in a panic, to do the whole thing slightly letterboxed so as to keep as much of Ramus in the film as possible? Perhaps if we knew just how much of Egon was removed by the pan and scan process for both films, it would give us an idea as to how likely that scenario could be. It was at this point I realized I would be spending several more hours of work on this video. Repeating the process of laying the VHS version over the Blu-ray copy, this is how much Harold Ramis was removed. Egon was in the first Ghostbusters for 26.7% of the film, and the pan and scan removed him from between almost 30 and 40%. This surprised me. Ramis, one of the writers, and with a higher screen credit, arguably saw more of his screen time reduced than Hudson in the original VHS home release. Could this have resulted in the decision to prepare Ghostbusters 2 with a pan and scan based on the 1.66 to 1 ratio to keep Ramus from losing as much screen time? Let's look at the data. In Ghostbusters 2, Egon lost from between almost a sixth and no more than a third of his screen time, a considerable improvement over the first film and slightly better than Winston this time around. But even more striking is the difference in how Egon was cut out between the films, especially how being completely cut went from almost 20% in the first film to just 6% in the second. And just like Winston, when Egon had to be cut, more of him still remained on screen than in the first film. Looking at these figures, it is more than possible that the choice to do the pan and scan at the 1.66 to 1 ratio was made to preserve as much of Ramus' screen time as they could, and any increase to Hudson's screen time 
was just an unintended bonus. Of course, there's nothing that would rule out the possibility that the feelings of both actors were considered when deciding on the pan and scan ratio. It's even possible that the 1.66 to 1 ratio choice was an accident. That ratio was popular for many European films, so perhaps the technicians had their equipment calibrated for European settings and by the time the VHS made it into production, it was too late and too expensive to correct the mistake. This scenario is unlikely, but mistakes do occasionally happen on an industrial scale, so it can't be completely ruled out. Unless the technicians responsible for doing the pan and scan for Ghostbusters 2 ever come out and discuss their reason for doing the film in the 1.66 to 1 ratio, all we can do is speculate. Ultimately, I have no concrete evidence at all about Ernie Hudson's alleged lawsuit against the studio over the VHS release of Ghostbusters. I asked my friend if they remembered the article, and while they said they did recall how after the original widescreen Laserdisc release, fans were talking about being able to finally see all of Winston's scenes uncut, they had no recollection of any lawsuits over the matter. While it's easy to dismiss my theory as the ravings of a guy who constantly has to check a thesaurus because he occasionally has a hard time remembering words after losing his thyroid, it's not uncommon for many films in Hollywood to have any number of lawsuits or threaten litigation. In fact, the more successful a movie is, the greater the likelihood that someone, somewhere, will lawyer up. Remember that Huey Lewis lawsuit I mentioned earlier? It's mostly common knowledge among Ghostbusters fans now, but certainly wasn't at the time. This was long before the internet, and it was a lot harder for gossip and rumors to spread to the mainstream when the general public had to wait for weekly or monthly magazines to report things. Studios often settle out of court and require everyone involved to sign non-disclosure agreements. But it's not impossible that a trade magazine heard a rumor that Hudson was angry over the VHS release and had discussed things with a lawyer, only for the studio to make Hudson a cash offer to keep quiet so as to not hurt any future Ghostbusters sales. Money not only keeps people quiet, but encourages them to maintain the lie, even when asked point blank about their experience. That's why even if one were to directly ask Hudson if he ever sued or threatened to sue the studio over the original home video release of Ghostbusters, the only answer that could be trusted would be yes. Because if he said no, that could either mean it never happened, or it did happen, but he has to lie to meet his legal obligation under a non-disclosure agreement. While a good performer and a reasonably successful character actor, Ernie Hudson never had the fame or clout of Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, or even Harold Ramis, so not only is it likely that any possible lawsuit or arrangement settled out of court would require him to remain quiet, he would not have the power or finances to ever disclose the matter publicly. The only reason we know about the Huey Lewis lawsuit is because he apparently could afford to break his non-disclosure agreement and the story was then spread online. But that non-disclosure agreement kept it quiet for 20 years. Who can say how many Hollywood secrets are still out there, silenced only by the fear of financial or career retribution? While arguably his most famous role, Ernie Hudson has had a sad history of being treated poorly by the Ghostbusters franchise. Not only were his parts cut down in the scripts for both films and his performances gutted by pan and scan, Hudson also lost out on playing the character he originated in the real Ghostbusters cartoon at a time when it was common for a live-action actor to reprise their role for the Saturday morning version. Long before The Matrix and John Wick films, Keanu Reeves was just this middling actor with a few film roles under his belt, but they still hired him to reprise his role in the Bill & Ted cartoon. Yet they gave what should have been Hudson's part in the real Ghostbusters to Arsenio Hall, who had far, far less acting experience than Ernie Hudson, who by that point had dozens of movies and television episodes on his resume. Again, I want to stress that I do not allege with any actual proof or certainty that Ernie Hudson once threatened to sue over being cut out of the VHS version of Ghostbusters. But between how much he was cut from that and the unusual VHS release of the sequel film, as well as the poor way he was treated by the ones in charge of the Ghostbusters franchise, a lawsuit like that wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility. Thank you for watching. 
If you enjoyed this video, please help this channel grow by clicking like and subscribe and checking out my other content. It's not all Scooby-Doo, but there's still a lot of Scooby-Doo.